In the last two years, I have visited the historic Natchez City Cemetery in Natchez, Mississippi for the beautiful cemetery landscape that is full of historical figures and some very sad tales. The graves have become famous and attracted people from all over. There are a lot of unique graves as well, such as the thunderstorm grave and the rocking chair grave. I have decided to create a new video and compile the two trips, which occurred in 2019 and 2021. The Natchez City Cemetery is 200 years old this year. It was established in 1822, high on the bluffs of the mighty Mississippi River. The people who died and occupied the space there reveal great history, mystery, and tragedy that tells the story of Natchez. Journey with me to some of the most famous grave sites in the cemetery and the stories behind them. Welcome back to my channel. If you're a first time viewer, I'm happy you found me. Be sure to subscribe, like, comment, share, and click the notifications for new content. Again, welcome and let's get into the story. William Johnson was born a slave, but freed as a young boy. He was known as the Barber of Natchez. He became very prosperous, owned three shops, and acquired substantial holdings, rental property, timberland, farm acreage, and slaves. He was highly respected for his fair dealings and good business judgment. His very detailed and comprehensive diary contributed considerably to the account of everyday life and times of those years in Natchez and, her, and earned him the title of American Diarist. He was murdered and his accused murderer was never convicted. William Johnson was murdered on June 16, 1851. Seventy-five years later, his diary was discovered and became one of the most important first-hand accounts of life in the antebellum South. He was born into slavery, but his owner, also named William Johnson and thought to be his father, emancipated him in 1820. His mother, Amy, had been freed in 1814 and his sister, Adelia, in 1818. Johnson trained with his brother-in-law, James Miller, as a barber and began working in Port Gibson, Mississippi. He returned to Natchez, becoming a successful entrepreneur with a barbershop, bathhouse, bookstore and land holdings. Though a former slave, he went on to own 16 slaves himself. He began a diary in 1835, which he continued through the remainder of his life. Also in 1835, he married Anne Battle, a free woman of color with a similar background to his, and they had 11 children. Johnson loaned money to many people, including the governor of Mississippi, who had signed his emancipation papers. Johnson, who was murdered in 1851 over a boundary dispute by a mixed-race neighbor named Baylor Wynn in front of his son, a free black apprentice and a slave, Wynn was held in prison for two years and brought to trial twice. Johnson was such a well-respected businessman that the outrage over his murder caused the trial to be held in a neighboring town. In that town, no one knew Wynn, so they didn't know that he was half black. Since Mississippi law forbade blacks from testifying against whites in criminal cases, Wynn's defense was that he was half white and half Native American, making him white by law. The defense worked. None of the black witnesses could testify, and Wynn escaped conviction. So this is why his, his murder case is not exactly cold. It's just that his murderer got away with it, and that's a shame. 
Johnson's diary was rediscovered in 1938 and published in 1951. It reveals much of the daily life of a 19th century Mississippi businessman, including the fact that he was himself later a slaveholder. His papers are archived at the Louisiana State University. Through an act of Congress, the home of William Johnson became a part of the Natchez National Historical Park in 1990. We are in search next, if we can find it. We're having trouble finding another grave. The barber of Natchez, William Johnson, born a slave and freed as a young boy, was known as the barber of Natchez. He became very prosperous, owned three shops, and acquired substantial holdings renting property, timberland, farm, acreage, and slaves. He was murdered, and his accused murderer was never convicted. I do not know who his accused murderer was, because it does not state that here, but I'll try to dig up some more information. But in the meantime, we are um, trying to find his grave, and his name is William Johnson. He was known as the Barber of Natchez. This beautiful angel monument is overlooking five headstones, each with the same date of death. On March 14, 1908, there was a huge explosion at the Natchez Drug Company, which was a five-story brick structure located at the corner of Main and South Union Street, Caddy Corner, from the Natchez Cathedral. The explosion was so massive, it totally destroyed the five-story building, killing numerous people, including the business employees that were working at the time. The explosion put the drug company out of business, but the owner of the Natchez Drug Company was so devastated that he purchased a lot to bury his employees, and he purchased this angel monument to place at their gravesite. His youngest employee was 12 years old. This monument is now referred to as the Turning Angel because at night when cars drive by on Cemetery Road, their headlights shine upon the monument and to some it appears to turn as their car passes by. Okay, so we are at the site of the famous Turning Angel, which what really makes the site unique or famous. We all know that statue's not really turning, but let's honor these little girls who died. These are the girls that died in the explosion at a pharmaceutical company here in Natchez, Mississippi. The youngest one is right here in the middle. She was 12. So their ages range from 12 to 22. There's one, two, three, four, five of them. And I'll try to say their names. This is, the la it just shows the last name. Booth, age 17 years, died March 14, 1908. Now they're all gonna have the same death date because they all passed away together in an explosion. And that's, that actually um, is behind the turning angel, I'll walk around there in a second, but her last name was White, she was 19 years old, Worthy, 12 years old, Netterville, age 17, and Murray, age 22. On the back side of the turning angel, where the girls died in the explosion, erected by the Natchez Drug Company to the memory of the unfortunate employees who lost their lives in the great disaster that destroyed its building on March 14, 1908. Kiri O'Murray, here's their names. 
I've already read their last names, but it's Carrie O. Murray, Inez Netterfield, Luella D. Booth, Mary E. Worthy, Ada White. And then it says, Thy will be done at the end. So this is the uh, famous plot of the Turning Angel. This is the plot for the Confederate Dead, um, which means every one of these people here passed away. Oh, they didn't pass away during the war necessarily because this is died February 15, 1922, age 78 years. No date on this guy's. Well, there is, but it's sinking into the ground. But it's still 19 something. 1929. All these right here. But some of these to be really. Oh, no, they're 90 years old. Okay, here's the unknown soldiers back here. Now, these would have been. Um, killed during the war, and what's so sad about it is um, they're still unknown. They're still in all of these unknown. Florence Irene Ford was born September 3, 1861 and died October 30, 1871. She died of yellow fever when she was only 10 years old. During her short life, she was extremely frightened of storms and whenever one occurred, she would rush to her mother to find comfort. Upon her death, her mother was so struck with grief that she had Florence's casket constructed with a glass window at the child's head. The grave was dug to provide an area the same depth of the coffin. It is actually six feet down. But this area had steps that would allow the mother to descend to her daughter's level so she could comfort Florence during storms. To shelter the mother during storms, hinged metal trap doors were installed over the area the mother would occupy while at her child's grave. If you visit Florence's grave today, which is in the Natchez City Cemetery, there is no longer a window. Um, in the mid-1950s, a concrete wall was erected at the bottom of the stairway covering the glass window of Florence's coffin to prevent vandalism. Okay, I'm gonna try this again. Like I said, I have, we have made it to the Natchez City Cemetery and I stepped in an ant bed and it threw me off. I was doing so well um, while I'm waiting for Scotty to get back. But this is little Florence Irene Ford. It's grave. She died when she was only 10 from yellow fever. And her mother was very distraught, as most parents would be, of course, from losing a child. And little Florence was, in life was scared of thunderstorms. So her mother couldn't bear the thought of her being out there by herself when it would, a thunderstorm would occur. She had, I'm looking on the ground for more ants, I do not want to step in that again. But she had this dugout built. Um, at one time, it did have a glass window, because she would come down these stairs, and there's the hatch she would pull over to shield herself from the rain. She would come down here when it was storm to comfort her daughter in death as well. And I do not know what year they covered up the window. That would 
have to be researched and looked up, but it's very steep. I have been down there before. Uh, I was down here last year, but I'm not going down this year. There's a little angel that's been watching over little Florence for how many years? Well over a century. Um, she's the only one in the Washington Board plot. The family plot. Here's the stupid ants that got me. And nobody knows really what happened to her mother um, she, uh, after uh, so many years. But she's the only one in the family plot. I have read that I think that her father is buried here somewhere in the cemetery. But why he's not in the family plot, I don't know why. Okay, everybody. This is the grave of Emma Jean Wenzel Venn. She was born in 1884 and died in 1918. She served as a Red Cross worker in France during World War I and was killed in the line of duty in 1918. She was the daughter of Theodore V. Wenzel, a Confederate veteran, who conducted a general store named Rumble and Wenzel at Natchez under the hill. Vin actually went to France as a volunteer with the American Cross, where she died of the flu. She is buried in the Natchez City Cemetery. So we are heading out of the cemetery, and I just happened to stop right here and look to my left. This lady is not on our map, but I read about her um, being buried in this cemetery. She was the Red Cross worker, Emma Jean Winsel Venn, I believe that says. Notice the red crosses on her grave here. Right here. She died during, I mean, she died during the uh, First World War, or the Great War, because saying that almost tongue ties me, but in 1918, the uh, First uh, World War lasted from 1914 to 1918. And she died. Um, serving her country as a Red Cross worker and brought back to Natchez and buried, so there it is.
I was talking to my nephew about the man buried in the rocking chair, Rufus E. Case. And I looked over to the right, and I was like, well, there it is. So I'm going to take you up. You see? I believe in 2002 that I read, they actually had to restore his grave because up until 2002, before they restored it, prior to that, um, they had to restore it because you could actually look through some of the cracks and still see the rocking chair with him sitting in it. Since 2002, you can see some of the old, this brick here where some of the concrete or the mortar, whatever you call that is, but this is him. And inside the grave, he had a child, I think it was a daughter, who had passed away before him. He died, he wanted to be buried near his child, and he wanted to be buried in his rocking chair facing towards the state of Louisiana. They set him in the rocking chair when he passed away, and they built this structure around him, this sort of pyramid-like, and so the little girl, I think, it is his daughter. I believe it says somewhere on here about his daughter. Okay, Laura, this must be her. Age seven years, yes, this would be her. Her name was Laura. And she's the daughter of Rufus E. and Margaret Case. And I think that says seven years. So she was buried here first in a regular grave, like something like this, I imagine. And then he wanted to be buried in his rocking chair. So they built this up around her grave, which you can no longer see. And he's inside there sitting in his rocking chair facing towards his home of Louisiana. Mr. Rufus E. Case, he's inside. Again, can you imagine though, just sitting in the rocking chair? And up until 2002, people were able to look through a, you know, a crack and still be able to see him. And so, and it looks like if, you know, that's why it was important to donate to the cemetery because they, you know, rely on the donations to fix things like this. By far, I have not been to a cemetery yet that I don't like as much as this one. Did that make sense? Did that feel right? <laughs> My nephew, hey Scotty. What do you think about this cemetery? It really is, right? And what makes this so unique is um, me and my niece were reading about it. Who couldn't be here if wanted to be, but I wish she was. She could just pee and all. But she really liked this story. It's a little bit of a romantic story, but it's also sad because come on, he lost his wife. I'm going to read a little bit to you. The tombstone is L.H. Lawrence's wife right here. And notice the toolbox under the bench. After his wife's death, and each day after work, Mr. Lawrence would come to her grave. Sometimes he was carrying his toolbox, but he often left it overnight at the grave. He would stand on the road just outside the plot and say a prayer. Then he would step into the plot and carefully trim the grass and clean his tombstone. Clean the tombstone while talking to his beloved his wife. Here. So he would be sleeping. Sometimes he would be found sleeping his wife's grave in the morning. He spent so much time here that they placed a bench, this bench, beside her grave. After his death, his toolbox was encased in plastic. I don't think it's encased in plastic anymore. So, just a little 
a story about a, a man who lost his wife and obviously was a This is the story of the African prince stolen from his kingdom, sold into slavery, and shipped to Natchez, Mississippi, at the height of the slave trade. Abdul Rahman was the son of King Sori. He was of West African royalty before he was enslaved on a Mississippi plantation in Natchez, Mississippi. After a shackled journey across the Atlantic, he was desperate to make the man about to purchase him, Thomas Foster, understand his terrible mistake. He wasn't supposed to be enslaved. The 26-year-old was the heir to one of Africa's most influential kingdoms. Instead of freedom, which he would carry for his next 40 years of enslavement. Little did he know, he actually was a prince. As a joke, but he would find out later the joke was on him thanks to Dr. John Cox. After his arrival in Natchez, and after being kidnapped by enemy troops in 1788 in his native Putajalan in what is now known as Guinea, the powerful royal was sold to slave traders for a few muskets and rum at the height of the global slave trade, when an estimated 80,000 Africans were being captured, chained, and shipped across the Atlantic Ocean every year. Abdul Rahman was a highly educated aristocrat. His dramatic quest for freedom would eventually catapult him to national celebrity, which means his remarkable life is more documented than most. The Prince's story divulges the brutalities of slavery. In all the years he longed for liberty, he made his stance so dramatic that he would capture the attention of American President John Quincy Adams. There is actually a movie you can watch. It's called A Prince Among Slaves. Um, it's the story about Abdul Rahman and about Thomas Foster, his slave owner. In addition, Dr. John Cox, who was an Irish doctor who migrated to Natchez. Now, several years prior to um, Abdul being abducted as a slave and brought to Natchez, Dr. John Cox was overseas in Africa and he was assisting medical needs for the country. Somehow, he got left behind in Africa, his ship left him, and he was stuck there for six months. He ran in to the prince's father, King Sori, who took him in, was very nice to him, helped him out. If it wasn't for him, the six months that Dr. John Cox ended up staying there, he probably, be, he probably would not have survived. Fast forward a few years later, after Prince Abdul Rahman has been abducted and brought to America where he will serve out a slave for 40 years. He runs into Dr. John Cox and I'm going to tell you about that story in the video to come. So before I get to that video where I explain a lot more about Cox's involvement and his significance, the prince that was kidnapped and sold and um, indentured as a slave for 40 years. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Cox as Cox ran into him years later, but I'm just going to read this real quick. The prince ran into Cox at the market where he was hawking vegetables. Cox saw an opportunity not only to right a grave injustice, 
but to repay his debt to the Sori's family. He set about trying to buy his freedom. Foster refused at any cost. As a matter of fact, it wasn't until Dr. John Cox came along and confronted Foster, and he was the one that actually t confirmed that yes, you do own a slave. You do own a prince for a slave. Well, this just made um, Thomas Foster's head even bigger. He's like, oh, really? He's a slave? Well, I'm not going to sell him for any amount because Cox did try to. Um, to uh, buy his freedom and offered him a thousand dollars, but Foster would not budge. Now backing back up, you have to remember Dr. John Cox. He uh, went to Africa and became shipwrecked. He only survived because he was rescued by a group of Fulanas who brought him to Timbo. There he met King Sori and his royal family who offered him medical care and friendship over a six month stay. So you can see why years later when Cox run in, runs into the prince, he's like, you know, he's so happy to see him. He's like, I owe you whatever you need. I can't believe you're even here. It's like, it's gotta be a shock to him because even Cox himself is an immigrant from Ireland. So what are the chances that both of them would eventually end up in the same place? And if it wasn't for Cox, he paved the road for the freedom of Abdul Rahman. When the prince was 67 years old, he was retired from hard labor and gained his freedom through the efforts of a printer Andrew Marshall, editor of the Mississippi State Gazette. Marshall enlisted the aid of Thomas B. Reed, Senator from Mississippi, and of Henry Clay, who was then Secretary's Secretary of State under John Quincy Adams. Unfortunately, when he set off sail for that last time at 67 years old, back to Africa with his wife, he died during his long journey home. He made it to Liberia, and shortly after that, he developed a high fever and he passed away. Sadly, Abdul Rahman never made it back to his homeland to see his other children and the rest of his family. Okay. We are on a search for one elusive grave we just cannot find and it's killing me. I have got to find it. It's about Dr. It's the grave of Dr. John Cox who assisted the prince among slaves, Prince Abdul Rahman. I think I said that right. He was the one that ended up in Africa way before they um, I want to kidnapped the prince and brought him to Mississippi, right here in Natchez, where he was made a slave for 40 years. Well, prior to that, before that happened, Dr. John Cox actually was on a trip to Africa. I can't remember why. I have to look that up. Um, but the main point is he tried to help Abdul. He uh, had, Abdul had helped him out when he got left behind because the ship left without him. And there is a documentary, and I know it's on Amazon Prime called A Prince Among Slaves. And you can, I'll, the title, 40 Years a Slave is about Prince Abdul Rahman. He helped Dr. Ch John Cox in Africa. For six months he was he was stuck there. And without Abdul's help, he probably would not have survived. Well, fast forward. And he was taken as a, a prisoner and then shipped to America during the height of the slave trade. He uh, he ran into Mr. Cox, Doc, I'm sorry, Dr. Cox. He ran into him 
at market in a market where he was allowed to sell some vegetables. Uh, his slave owner allowed him to do that every Sunday. And when Dr. Cox ran into him, he was just like, oh my God. Long story short, he tried to barter with uh, uh, Foster. I can't remember Thomas Foster, I believe. Anyway, he was the uh, slave owner, and he would not. He was like, "Oh, you mean he really is a prince?" He was like, "Yeah, he's a prince. Um, he doesn't belong here and everything." And he would not let go of him. And then, but it led to getting the attention of the president, uh, John Quincy Adams. But. He wouldn't guarantee the release, the freedom of Ramon's children who he married over here in Natchez. He married again. He had to, he had no choice, his life had to go on, right? Um, and he had nine children here in Natchez. And, but they wouldn't release, they wouldn't release the children, but and I guess they became free after um, the abolition. Slavery was abolished, but uh, we are <laughs> search of his grave, and Dr. John Cox is the one that really tried to help him, and, and he did, he actually did eventually, I mean, it led to his freedom. Unfortunately, Prince Abdul Rahman died when he, he and his wife made the tri trip back to Monrovia in Africa, which is named after... President James Monroe. Liberia is known, known for, I mean, they speak English there. Um, it's like the second, they call it the second America. I don't know, but that's where most of your slave trade took place to bring slaves to America was in Liberia, Monrovia. So I'll let you know if we find it. Find Dr. John Cox. He's out here somewhere. For new content and breaking news stories, please be sure to click the notifications to follow along and be notified when updates are available. Don't forget to like, comment, and please feel free to share. You can also join my Facebook group for True Crime and History Time and follow me on TikTok and Instagram. My usernames for those platforms are at Jerry Scarborough Official. And as always, thank you for watching, subscribing, and supporting my channel.